We tend to hire people that don't have a lot of dental experience or minimal experience because the price tag that comes with them is attractive. And I'm not saying that that's, that's the wrong thought process. That's a young business owner's process. So I can't fault you for that. Hey, Ambitious Dentist, welcome to Start Your Dental Practice, the show for existing and aspiring dentists to take your dental practice to the highest possible level. I'm your host, Jonathan Van Horn, CPA and ABV, founder of DentistMetrics.com. In every episode, we aim to demystify the how to start a dental practice problem by bringing on world-class dentists, influencers, and consultants in the dental industry to pick their brain about how to get past the barriers involved from going from no practice to being a practice owner to owning your own successful dental practice. Hello, ambitious dentist. Have you ever been to a conference or event and have just one speaker blow you away? Not just because of their knowledge of the subject, but because of their stage presence as well. Well, we're recently attending a course by my friend Jamie Amos. I had the pleasure of hearing Teresa Duncan take the stage and share everything she knew about dental insurance. And she was that one that had just amazing content for me. So as a dental CPA, I'm certainly not an expert when it comes to dental insurance. So I found her discussion to be both informative as well as easy to understand. And I knew I just had to bring her on the show. It's really an interview you do not want to miss. So here are a few things we're going to cover on today's show what Teresa learned from being both an office manager and a dental assistant, the biggest mistakes most dentists make when it comes to insurance and the steps you can avoid them, the bad habits you can't afford to have your office managers have, how to identify an all-star employee, and a whole lot more. So if you've been wanting to figure out how the insurance game is played to start this new year off for you, then this interview is for you. Now, here's my interview with Teresa Duncan. Hello, Ambitious Dentist. So today I have with us someone that I heard speak at a conference with a really great friend of mine, Mr. Jamie Amos. We we were talking at a conference. I heard her come up and speak. My jaw kind of went to the floor to see all the great content that she had of something that, to be honest with you, I had like when I started in this industry, I thought I want to know the ins and outs of everything that has to do with this topic that we're going to talk about today. And as I got more and more down the the rabbit hole of this particular subject, I realized I don't want to have anything to do with this because it is so difficult for me to wrap my head around as somebody who is on the outside looking in. And so today's topic and what we're going to be talking to our guest about is uh, insurance and dental practices and just the way that it works inside of y'all's practices. One of the biggest questions I get from new practice owners is, how does all this insurance stuff work? I'm afraid because I'm going to a practice and I'm going to own it and 90% of my revenue comes from an insurance company and I don't have any clue what's going on with it. So I heard today's speaker and I said, she gets it. She understands it. I got to get her on the podcast to talk to you guys. And so our guest today is Teresa Duncan with Odyssey Management. She is a fantastic speaker. She has a lot of really cool information about this, this topic in general. Um, and she also has a, a, a podcast of her own called the no- Nobody Told Me That Podcast, which I think is a fantastic title for a, a dentistry related podcast because that is, you know, everyone's always afraid of the things that they don't know. Uh, and uh, she also has a, a book out called uh, Moving Your Patients to Yes, which is a easy insurance conversations, which is a great, great way, uh, something to have for your uh, your administrative people to be able to look through and be able to learn about. And uh, she also does public speaking. She has an online course about all of this insurance information, which is just blows my mind uh, that uh, we've not been connected before other than that conference. Uh, so Teresa, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, I'm really excited about the episode. Wow. Thank you so much for this intro. That was phenomenal. I, <laughs> wow. I need to bring you on the road with me a little bit more, I think. <laughs> I, I can I can be the hype man. I can come in before and be like, this is great. I don't want to learn any of this, but it's like, great. <laughs> we need some pyrotechnics like WWE style. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, you know, I, I would uh, not be mistaken for many wrestlers. I would be, I am definitely the persona of a CPA accountant. So, um, <laughs> no, I'd, I'd step out and everyone would just kind of laugh. So, uh, but yeah, so, you know, we met at Jamie's, one of, one of Jamie Amos's courses and, uh, the, the, the topic you, you, you bring to the table is again, something that I'm just really surprised not more people talk about because it is a huge, huge piece 
of the dental game, if you will, of the business of dentistry. And so, you know, I like to ask everybody when they come on the podcast, you know, how did you get to the point where you are today? Like, you know, you just one day say, hey, insurance billing, that sounds like something that's really interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to become a consultant on that. <laughs> Isn't that, you know what, that's really sad, but that might be actually how it happened. So <laughs> I really had no choice but to become the insurance expert. I was, uh, I was working in an office for a long time and uh, the doctor didn't know, he didn't want to know my a clinical assistant. She just kind of, you know, she kind of laughed when I had a question about claims because she was so happy to say that's not my thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I pretty much had to learn it myself. And I started out in dentistry as an assistant, never had to deal with admin stuff, then found out I liked admin stuff. So went through the whole receptionist thing, went through the whole being the office manager. Um, now, insurance ended up being a bigger part of my role towards the later years of being a manager. So I kind of became a go-to for other offices in the area, you know, meeting with other office managers. I, I was always the one that they would call for advice and it was, I was happy to get it and I was happy to give it um, from other, to other people. So that, that kind of turned into its own thing locally. And I started speaking for study clubs and doing more speaking. And I, I quit, let me see, I quit about 10 years ago, full time and then just started Odyssey Management. And it's been it's been a roller coaster ever since. A good roller coaster. A good roller coaster. It's always like that when you have a new a new chapter in your professional career, isn't it? So tell me, you know, so to the people that are listening today, they're they're people that are either going to be soon to be practice owners, they're new practice owners, or they're just trying to learn more about the business of dentistry in general. What are some of the, like the biggest mistakes you should be, see, especially new practice owners making when it comes to this whole insurance game? Uh, whew, that is, you know, that's a that's a loaded question. Oh, yeah. I I love it, I love it, but it's it's got a lot of layers to it. So, uh, first thing that comes to mind is that we tend to hire people that don't have a lot of dental experience or minimal experience because the price tag that comes with them is attractive. And I'm not saying that that's that's the wrong thought process. That's a young business owner's process. So I can't fault you for that. Uh, what you have to understand though, is that when you're dealing with contracts and, you know, your license on the line and that sort of thing, you, you don't want someone that is completely fresh off the street unless you commit to getting them the correct training, to making sure they take classes, to making sure they have an accurate code book. Uh, I'm talking to one doctor right now. Uh, I'm sorry, one office manager right now and the doctor won't even buy them a code book because she says the codes are in the computer and that's all she needs. And that's, that is not mm. at all how mm. it is. Yeah. So, I mean, I understand that the costs are big, the student loans are big, the, the build out costs are big. You see all those numbers, but one, one place I wouldn't scrimp is just making sure they have the resources and, and then give them, get a little patience for this. So not patience that we see, but get, have a little patience when, when they're learning this, this insurance stuff is not easy. I, it's a struggle to stay on top of it for me. So imagine somebody who's, you know, busy all day and having to catch all of these errors. It's, it's just not easy. So I think going in with expectations that somebody can go in, learn it and get it done is, I think that's the first fallacy that, that I run into. You know, and we see that a lot, you know, you know, one of the first things that uh, we, we looked at whenever we started our company, because we you now talked about on the podcast, we, we used to be an outsourced CFO company for dental practices. So that was kind of the reason I thought, hey, I want to learn a lot about insurance stuff because there's a lot of opportunity to help out a lot of practices. Uh, because I, I know that there's got to be a lot of errors that are occurring inside of this, this ecosystem. And, you know, one of the things we also looked at was staffing cost. And we know we try to get these certain percentages correct as far as how much of our revenue should be going to our staff and things like that. And initially, we had the incorrect assumption that the way to do that is to, you know, make sure you're not overpaying people. And then as we grew and as I learned more about the industry, I realized it's not about overpaying the wrong people. It's about paying the right people the right amount. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, honestly, when you start out, uh, you know, you didn't, doctors didn't open up a dental practice and just were familiar with what scalers are, or what drills were. They had to take a lot of classes and it, it's not really dissimilar. Uh, you know, you do need to understand what the codes are, why the contracts matter, how to talk to patients. That's probably the number two thing that we can talk about, how to talk to patients about insurance. Uh, you, you can't just throw somebody into this job and assume that they're going to learn because every mistake that they make is a patient being dissatisfied or a write-off that's huge. I mean, it all adds up. 
It really does. It really does. So as far as that, that new practice owner and being able to understand all this insurance stuff, there's a bit of a, a parity there of the new practice owner doesn't know anything. They're trying to find somebody for the right person to sit in the right seat to do this stuff for them. And the person trying to pick the person for that spot has no experience with it either. So <laughs> where do you go to be able to get this information? Because I, I know people ask me this, this question all the time. So there's a couple different resources for hiring. And, and I think, you know, I, I don't want to get into all of that because that's, you know, that's a human resources thing. But definitely you have resources like dentalpost.net. The ADOM has a job board. Um, it's American Association of Dental Office Management. They have a job board. Uh, and you could ask for somebody that has minimum one to two years of dental experience. And then when you get them in the, uh, the interview, I would ask them some insurance specific questions, such as what is the most difficult plan you've worked with or what, you know, I give them a scenario. Here's where I'm seeing a new patient. I take this, this type of film. What codes would you use? And somebody with one to two years experience, one year experience would at least be able to answer those. And then you can judge from, you know, whether or not they're open to being quizzed. When I, when I used to interview people as a manager, I, I always had red flags up when somebody was felt like I was questioning their knowledge, oh, yeah. uh, you know, like, so I keep an eye out for that because the biggest mistake I have seen is, okay, so let me, let me qualify that because there's so many big mistakes we've seen. One of the biggest mistakes <laughs> <laughs> we've seen is that you will go through an interview. There'll be somebody in front of you who knows what they're doing and they'll tell you, oh, I've been doing insurance for 20 years. I know what I'm doing. Don't worry about it. I've got your back. I've got it under control. And you go home and you're thinking, finally, I have somebody that's going to be able to handle this. Well, somebody who was really good at insurance 10 years ago, five years ago, is not going to be somebody who's good at insurance today. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it's so different. So ask topical questions, ask them which Facebook groups they belong to, because I want to know if they're out there actually trying to look for some of the, um, you know, some of the answers. There are some fantastic dental Facebook groups that they talk about insurance all the time. Ask them what their go-to coding guide is. And if they say, well, I don't really have one, then that's a problem right there. Because somebody who wants to be good at insurance and is going to be good at insurance has found Dr. Blair's books, has found my webinars. They found a resource because they, they've gone out and done it on their own. So I would ask those types of questions rather than just waiting for somebody to say, oh, yeah, I know insurance. I mean, that's not enough nowadays. It really isn't. You know, it, it, it's just not enough of a knowledge base for a lot of people to be able to make those informed decisions. So whenever you're trying to get those pieces in front of people, how do you get, like you said, you, you have to, it, it's a fine line of, hey, I'm doing something to help train you and I want you to do better. And another line of, I want you to take this seriously. Like, you know, there, like you said, with the consulting, there are, I, I have clients that all the time talk about how the consultant came in and the staff was offended or they felt like something <laughs> was, they were, you know, that they were trying to tell them to do something wrong. I mean, what's a way for to be, for people to be able to get past that? What's a way for people to be able to, you know, take that as a, as a training opportunity and then as opportunity to do your job better than, because, okay, especially whenever a practice is acquired, this happens, you know, the office manager, if you will, has, has been there for 25 years. They're the one who's always done insurance and they've always done it the same way or they've done it mm -hmm. one way or the other. And, you know, you and I were talking before the call that, you know, anytime you do something the same way for a long period of time, that allows you to pick up a bad habit and let that habit continue forever if you don't look at it and get a refresher on it. Absolutely. So how, Absolutely. how do you really, you know, prepare people for a change like that? How do you prepare people to be an employee, to have some type of, of, of constructive training, even if they, you know, think that they know everything about everything? Well, so it really boils down to how much of a leader you're willing to be in order to get that result. So as a manager, when I am going to assign a task to an employee, I'm going to also in my mind or even to them, but in my mind, I'm going to have a deadline for this. I'm going to have a goal by which they should have achieved, you know, the, the end result. And as a manager, when you, or I'm sorry, as a practice owner, if you want the new people that 
you know, come with a practice or old people that come with a practice to learn something, you let them know, you know, I, I expect you to understand and, and have taken this course. I expect you to have a mastery of the topic uh, by and then give them a reasonable date. But it's up to you as the leader to check back with them and to assess that that's been done. So it's real easy for and I, I used to do this all the time as a manager before I realized I was running in circles. I would just kind of bark out an order and expect people to to do it. Uh, and, and I would expect that because that's how I operated. When, mm-hmm. when my boss told me what to do, it was done. You know, he very rarely had to follow up on me. And when he did, it was always like, oh, good, I did it. I, mean, I feel kind of proud about that. But we as leaders and, and managers tend to assume that everybody operates with that that same intention. And that's not always the case. Some people need to be prodded along. And quite frankly, some people are found out by this. You know, you I've, I've definitely had doctors purchase my online course, and because we can track the progress of that person through the course, the administrative person will say, oh, yeah, I took that course. It's all done. And we can see that she logged in for, say, 10 minutes, and that was it. And that, you know, that's a whole different issue than just not knowing insurance. That's mm-hmm. that's the kind of – that's the caliber of person you want at your office. You have to question that. So how much of a leader do you want to be? How much accountability do you want to – do you want to give to these people? And then definitely you have to follow up on it. These veteran team members who come with an office and they're part of an acquisition, many, they're, they're valuable. They're super valuable. I, I would love for every one of them to be able to stick around and to contribute. But the hard fact is that a lot of them have become very comfortable in their jobs and just need a little bit of a shakeup. I don't think they necessarily need to be gone. I mean, there's a lot of good workers out there and who best knows the practice in the area, but you know, if you're a leader and a practice owner, you need to be you need to be the person who's able to give that little kick in the butt. It, it's your practice, so you should be totally okay with doing that. Completely agreed. So, so let's move a bit into more of a like um, some of those bad habits that you see some of these uh, office managers or insurance coordinators developing over the years. What are some of the more specific ones that you, you've seen occur so that people can be aware that this could be occurring in, in their practice? Oh, I'll, I'll give you the number one pet peeve that I see. And the number one indicator is when you have somebody who is not questioning the EOBs at all. So as a new practice owner, when you hire somebody, what you'll see, you'll spend actually a, a ridiculous amount of your time looking at EOBs. That's because your your person is new, you're new to this, you're going to be scrutinizing EOBs like crazy. That doesn't stop. I hate to say it. That doesn't stop because they're they're so they can be really complex. They're changing, there are errors that happen. So if you have a, a office manager or an insurance coordinator who seems to never come to you with those issues or seems to never vent. I mean, they may not need you to solve them. They can solve them, but it, I mean, they should be venting about it. At least they should be running into these issues. What that tells me is you have somebody who just processes it as it as they see it. And there's no questioning, which means there's no appeals being filed. There's write-offs that are being taken because it's easier to just write it off than to appeal it. Um, there's There's no picking up the phone and saying what gives to the insurance company. There's no fighting on behalf of the patient. It's just somebody who's in there to enter in checks and that's it. So I'd keep an ear to the ground on that. And and I will tell you, uh, when I was uh, doing lots of consulting, the number one reason that we would get a call is an, a, a doctor would realize that they were writing off way more than they needed to. And they were actually having to cut cut an awful lot of refund checks to patients. Now that probably triggers you um, (laughs) because you're probably familiar with that. But, and that whenever we heard that on the initial consultation, I always knew that it was somebody who just had stopped fighting for the insurance um, or fighting for the patient in order to get more benefits. That person was just writing off either because they didn't know or because they just didn't care. Hey guys, sorry for the interruption. Really quick announcement for you. And if you're going to be a dental practice owner, you know you're at some point going to have to get a dental practice loan, whether it's going to be to acquire a dental practice or it's going to be to start a startup dental practice. You're going to have to get a loan. And I'm really proud to say that a company that I've worked with personally dozens of times over the past few years is our first sponsor after 80 episodes of Start Your Dental Practice. And our first sponsor is Bank of America Practice Solutions. So whenever you're going to be getting a new loan, whenever you're going to get a loan for starting your dental practice or acquiring a dental practice, 
you really want to make sure that you have three things when it comes to that loan. Number one, you want a really great interest rate. Number two, you want to make sure that the company that you're speaking with has a, a lot of experience and can guide you through the best path to be able to become a practice owner through the loan process. And number three, you want to make sure that the terms associated with that loan are the most advantageous for you. And I'm really happy to say that all three of these things, Bank of America just knocks it out of the park for you. It's really a no brainer. If you're going to have to get a loan, which you are going to have to do 100%, you may as well go with a company that has a great interest rates, has great experience with the industry, and has the best terms out there in the market today. So if you're currently in the process of shopping loans, 100% give Bank of America Practice Solutions a try. And if you would mention that you came through the SYDP community, it would help out the podcast a lot and also allow us to give back to our very gracious sponsors. Again, this is an advertisement, a paid advertisement. If you go to them, I will, uh, you know, have more advertising revenue come to me. So if you enjoy the podcast, I would appreciate you helping out our sponsors. Uh, and if you are interested in that loan process, just text the word bank loan, one word, B A N K L O A N to 33444. Again, that's bank loan to 33444. And we will reach out to you. Thanks, guys. And so, you know, if something like that is uh, occurring, you know, how much money is being lost in a situation like that? Thousands, thousands. I bet, I mean, a thousand even per day, if you really want to think about it, depending on how high volume you are. Uh, when you have write offs, that and especially if you have two insurance companies, you've got team members. I see this all the time. They will write off after the first one comes in, then they'll write off after the second one comes in. And sometimes those write offs are even more than the total that we build. And you know, you can see how quickly you can get into the red uh, on some of these numbers. I, I would definitely take a look at your write offs, and that's one thing that we teach. Um, I to make sure your your courtesies. I don't call them discounts, but your courtesies, your discounts um, are as delineated as possible. And and from a CPA point of view, you probably like that too. I don't like just one big miscellaneous adjustment. I need it to be as specific as possible. And as a practice owner, I need you to take a look at that on a regular basis, whether it be weekly, monthly, uh, you know, have the CPA look at it. Uh, I mean, do you see that a lot where it's just one big adjustment and you really can't tell what the heck that is? Oh yeah, absolutely. So we'll have at times whenever, uh, you know, and I don't see a lot of the practice management reports, um, but on occasion I'll ask, what is the adjusted production for some clients if they're engaged with us in a, in a, in a manner that makes that uh, logical to do so? And then I'll look at it and they'll say, okay, here's um, a million in production and there's $100,000 in adjustments and then there's $80,000 in deletions and then <laughs> there's 20000 in miscellaneous whatever it is. Uh, and then you start at some point being like, you know, why is there deleted items that are on here? Yeah. And, you know, maybe, you know, for the example I'm giving, the one was in EagleSoft that they were just, instead of adjusting anything that had already been entered, they were just overriding it. And mm -hmm. EagleSoft was deleting the old entry and creating the new one. Uh, and, you know, from an audit trail perspective, that is is a deficiency from an internal control standard, I would assume. Uh, sure. I'm not an auditor. But um, so, yeah. So, yeah, we see that kind of stuff all, uh, fairly often. And it's, and it's crazy. You'll see completely different numbers from uh, in completely different ways to do the exact same thing office to office. And I, I believe, and you can tell me better than this, I believe that's because of the fact that there are so many ways to get to the end result that are exactly the same, but like, but because in the practice management systems, because they're, they're all so different. Um, but there's really only a technically a couple of ways to do it correctly to where everything flows the right way. Well, correctly and then also consistently. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we see often is when there's turnover. Uh, we'll see that one person was taking the write-off in the beginning. One person was not taking the write-off at all. Uh, and so it gets really, really jumbled. So having a, a not just a one consistent system, but also one that's clear that everybody understands. Uh, when I talk to team members and I say, well, why did you take this adjustment? A lot of times they'll say, well, that's just how I was taught. They're not really thinking through why they need to take that, that type of adjustment. And, and I'm a big, I'm a big, big fan of fee schedules. 
using the mm -hmm. fee schedules in the computer. So yeah, you're going to bill your full fee to the insurance company, but I want you to use those fee schedules so that you're not taking the adjustment twice. Uh, if you use the fee schedules, then you really don't need to take the adjustments at the end when the EOBs come in. And that way you can see, you know, is my number off? Do I need to write an appeal? Why did they deny this? You don't, you're not dealing with all the extra math of the difference between full fee and PPO fee. Uh, that, that was also another, that's a big uh, red flag for me when an office is not using fee schedules. I can, I can almost predict with 100% certainty that there's going to be issues with adjustments because they just, you know, there's too many numbers going because it's just easier for them to write that off and then you take the loss and you're not going to catch that until, unless you have a, a good CPA who's able to catch that or a consultant that's able to catch that. If you're not looking for it, you're not going to catch it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Basically, what you're saying is, is, is bad training, not understanding the software and bad habits are uh, one of the, the biggest mistakes that practice owners tend to find themselves in. And uh, we combat that with training. Uh, and, you know, give, give me some other examples because you, you had some in, in your, in your um, presentation that you gave that were, you know, we see practices doing this uh, and really they should be doing it this way. Uh, sure. Sure. So the, the using the fee schedules is the first one, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's almost like a, that's a, I honestly don't, didn't even like to start consulting with, a, with an office unless they agree to do it this way because things just get so convoluted. I see so, so many I, doctors that are just like, I just don't want to see the big write-off number at the end of the year. I just want to see what I made. I don't want to have to know what my, I don't want to have to look at the adjusted production report. I just want to look at the production report. <laughs> like, I know. They, yeah. Like they want to think that they're making, you know, a million five or, you know, producing a million five, but they're really not. It's, you know, down to a million two or one or whatever. And, and I get that that's an ego hit. I mean, nobody, I mean, gosh, remember the first time we had a, a job, Jonathan, when we were like, we would see our gross paycheck. And then when the net came, we would like cry. Like, remember that way back right, when, right. you know, so I understand why doctors are, really not not wanting to do it that way but it's the honest way it's the true way there's no as a consultant i don't want to pump you up saying you know hey look at you you're making a million five when when that's not what you're making and and that so i think a lot of dentists need to just be really true with themselves about that i, I will say the majority of the industry the ones that i talk to are uh, and you know when i speak across the country most of them are using the fee schedules i don't see it you know maybe maybe five years ago you'd see a lot of huh you know kind of lost looks in the audience but most of them because they're ppo more ppo savvy than before are using fee schedules so i'm thankful about that um, i would say that if you are not billing things because they're too hard to get paid i think that's the other uh common common mistake i see uh, you know I'll, I hear it being justified by saying, I don't, you know, I'm not going to bill for the buildups because they never get paid and it's just going to take my front office person longer to get everything covered. So I just don't bill for them. And every plan is different. You know, sure, you're going to have to fight harder on some plans for the buildup, but other plans are going to pay it with absolutely no problem. Uh, so you know, take a good coding class and then back that up. With And I think at the end of my presentation, when I was talking about documentation, I think that's when I saw your eyes get the widest. So let's back it up with the whole documentation thing. Because if you don't document the reason why you're asking for all of these benefits from the insurance company, they're not going to pay it. So I would say know your codes, be prepared to back it up with documentation, and make sure that you are looking at those EOBs and identifying, you know, lost money that you're leaving on the table, really. Um, so that's, that I think was a lot of the, I mean, I was only speaking for an hour down at Jamie's group, but I think that was a lot of it. Um, the other part of it, and this is where I think we had some real crowd interaction and always some crowd interaction with this is, uh, networks. So networks are really frustrating a lot of doctors and, and, you know, I don't know what else to say as far as predicting what's going on with networks other than it's not changing. It's, it's getting, um, I think more convoluted. I think it's harder for doctors nowadays to realize what network they're in and, uh, hopefully we'll see some remedy, but I, I not in the near future. I don't think. So, you know, extrapolate that on a bit more. When you, when you say a network, sure. are you talking about like a specific insurance company or are you talking about one of these networks that you join and then all of a sudden you're enrolled with all of these? Yeah. So those, those are the least networks. And so, you, you know, you, 
you definitely, I mean, I hear this all the time. I probably get an email a day about this. I found out I'm in this network. How did this happen? Uh, and so that's definitely a big issue, but also the networks that are converting a lot of their patients over to exclusive networks. That's another, I think 2018 is going to be the year where people realize, holy you know, holy cow, what's this exclusive network thing? And those are EPOs, exclusive provider organizations. What EPO basically stands for is the patient has benefits, but only if they go to an EPO level dentist. And you may be just a preferred dentist, not an EPO dentist. And so, you know, it looks on the surface like that patient is okay to come to us, but they got a new card, say January 1st, that now says EPO and you are PPO, and now you're going to end up having a patient who's mad at you. So I'm getting the word out now that, you know, January, you really do need to check these. That's when most of the plans turn over. We really need to check to make sure that a lot of the plans haven't switched to EPO versus PPO. Uh, I think that's going to be the, the next the next domino that's going to fall that's going to really upset people. So will you have to like Upgrade or down, I guess, in a way, downgrade your, yeah. your fees in order to become a preferred person as a way yeah. to get first picking. Yes, yeah, so you go down to exclusive. You'd go down to exclusive, and you would. Uh, so it's it's usually a lower fee schedule. Um, and if you, the patient comes to you and you're not an EPO, then there are no benefits. Period. And that's you know when you sign up to be say a, an Acme provider. And you find out that, okay, you're an Acme provider, but you're still not getting paid because, hey, there's this new benefit level that, you know, we just kind of rolled out. That's a lot of providers are gonna, not going to be happy about that. Uh, so I, I think that's why we need to check on, on the EPO status. Uh, and, and we have to be sure to have really good conversations with our patients about that if we do find out that, you know, this plan is going to switch to an EPO plan. Uh, because now we have to deal with, okay, yes, we are in network, but not for your employer. And we have to phrase that really well so that the patient feels comfortable. Yeah, coming to you, but you know, now they're paying out of pocket and that's, that's going to be really tough because I think doctors are going to lose some patients, um, not because they're bad doctors, but because patients tend to take a look at, you know, how much is going to cost for them out of pocket. That's going to be tough. Yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely a segment of the market uh, and demographics that a hundred percent, you know, the, the amount of cash outlay they have at the provider is a big determining factor of how much they like that provider, yeah. uh, you know, at, at the end of the day. Um, so that, that's definitely a lot of risk for a lot of people. So as far as the big issues that you, you've outlined, I, I agree with all, everything you've said so far. Um, and uh, the things that I don't quite understand, I, 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 I feel like you've given me a good explanation of them. <laughs> So, um, you know, one of the things that I do see, you know, or I have heard is, and you can extrapolate on this as much as you can, but you, you mentioned uh, an office not just, just not charging for buildups. I've seen that personally. Um, you know, back in the day, we used to do a lot more analyzing of the fee structures and you'll go through and you'll see 400 crowns and you'll see zero buildups. Right. Uh, and I'll ask the office, why do I not see any buildups on here? And they say, well, nobody ever pays for it, so we just don't ever submit for it. Are there any other issues like that one? Because I know that there are some companies and some ways to get reimbursed for those uh, for certain policies. Sure. Yeah. In the beginning of implant coverage, it was pretty common that you would they would pay, insurance companies would pay for just the implant placement, but not the restoration. Or conversely, they would pay for just the restoration, but not the placement of the implant. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't run into a lot of plans where both would be covered. But I see that more and more nowadays. But because we are so used to that being, you know, almost a, a standard, a lot of offices will say, oh, well, we didn't realize we could bill for both. You know, they're billing for just, you know, just one or the other. And and what they do is a lot do a lot of uh, global fees. So they'll charge, say, $3,000 for a whole implant case, but only bill certain codes in order to get paid. And that's, you know, that's not the way to do it. Um, I also see a lot of offices billing just so that they know they can get paid. Uh, for example, if the patient uh, is a new patient and they've come in and they've, you know, they've switched insurance, they'll bill an FMX, even though they take a bite wing set because the patient came in with their FMX from like last year. But because the patient has new insurance, the team is, you know, the doctor is, is taking advantage of that. And 
what I hear a lot, let me just talk real, real quickly on billing that isn't quite kosher. Mm -hmm. And, and I think there's, there's two types of offices that do this. So there's one where it's outward. I mean, they're just rotten. There's no two ways about it. They, they know what they're doing. Um, I will get emails that say, Hey, I've got this situation. You think I'm going to get caught if I build this, this and this. I mean, those are actual emails I get. And, and I, you know, yes, you're going to get caught. I, you know, cause don't email me with that. <laughs> but uh, the other, the other office type is one that just has not taken a formal course and they're kind of flying by the seat of their pants or they get into these groups that, you know, and take, take advice at face value. They're not really doing the research on their own. So it's important to take a class on coding so that you know what's, what's proper and what's not. Now, uh, one surface composites when ceilings weren't covered because they kind of justify that it's sort of the same thing. And when you have an office that is really crunched with a bad fee schedule, they're trying to get their, you know, trying to get it off the ground, their loans are coming due, you know, the, the rationalization is real. I, they, there's a lot of mental gymnastics that can happen there and just resist that because at some point it's going to come back to you. Um, the amount of audits are, is insane nowadays compared to five years ago. It's, it's insane. Everybody, I'll give you an example. When I'm in a class and I'll say, how many of you have had an audit? You know, five years ago, nobody would raise their hand because it was like a badge of shame. And now I'll say that and people will raise their hand no problem because it's almost like a fact of life, especially for pediatric practices. They, they tend to get a lot of audits because of their participation with Medicaid. So uh, long, long answer to your question <laughs> is, there are definitely codes that you could use, but maybe you don't because you worked at a, maybe you associated at a place where they didn't use those codes and you never knew they existed. Uh, one example is extractions. Uh, I know a lot of doctors who are using, uh, you know, they're, they're actually doing socket preservation when they take extractions or have extractions and, and they're using uh, cheaper materials because they don't, they know it's not going to get covered. They don't bill for the socket preservation. Uh, and that's actually a code that I see reimbursed. Uh, another one is gingivectomies, uh, 4211 and 4212. I don't see those a lot on production reports, but most of the time I hear that the doctors are doing it. And, and it's definitely, I think a habit. I think you just realize it's harder to, you think that it's harder to get these paid. So you just fall into the habit of not billing for it. And then it's moved on and now we have benefits for it. And you're still stuck with the idea that it's not going to be covered. And that's such a, a risk to your revenue. And if you're already doing the work, why not bill for it and just, just get the money for it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, Teresa, you've been great today. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate all the insight you've given. I know there's a lot of people out there going, wow, I really need to, to look at this uh, insurance side of things again. <laughs> and, you know, if they're needing some type of help like with that, what's a good way for them to be able to, you know, be able to potentially be in contact with you, maybe take your course or just to hear more about your you and what you do? Well, I, I appreciate it. I, this has been fun. Uh, I, I definitely have uh, some resources for your, your listeners. You know, I have a, a book that I wrote that's all about patient conversation. Yes. And, and that can be found on the website. And the online course is about four hours on how to be a really good insurance coordinator. And that, that can be found on my course too. And I'll, I'll make sure that your readers are able to, you know, take that at a, at a good, a good price. And, then also, if you see me on the road, uh, feel free to you know, come into the class, to ask me questions. I, a lot of specialists are, are hiring me to come in and talk to their their general offices, and that has been just so much fun. So, you know, keep, just keep an eye on my travel schedule. It's on my website, odysseymgmt.com. And, you know, there's always a webinar coming up. There's always a course coming up. So I hope to meet more of, uh, more of your listeners on the road. And gosh, I hope I run into you again on the road sometime soon. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't get out that much. Uh, I, I like to, you know, I, I, I broadcast from my ivory tower here in Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, <laughs> and, uh, enjoy that immensely. Uh, we, you know, we've got a, a young family, so I don't do a whole lot of traveling, but I am out four or five times a year speaking at conventions and things like that. So we may run into each other again. So again, awesome. thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, it's been, it's been very enlightening and I really appreciate your time, Teresa. Guys, if, uh, you even appreciated the time as well and enjoyed the episode, please make sure to go to odysseymgmt.com to find out more about Odyssey Management as well as uh, Teresa and check out the podcast. Nobody told me that podcast since you're uh, ob obviously a, a podcast person if you're listening to me today. So uh, go out there, give Teresa a, a sub subscribe uh, 
push and be uh, on the lookout for more from her in the future. So Teresa, thank you so much. Uh, It's very much appreciated again. And guys, we'll see you next time. And so that's it for today, Ambitious Dentist. Again, I'm Jonathan Van Horn, CPA and ABV. I'll see you next week with another world-class practice owner or consultant that will help you start your very own dental practice.